Um, so I work in astrophysics. A lot of my work is on planet formation, um, study uh, dust dynamics, and a lot of that is dust dynamics in protoplanetary disks, which are the environments that we think planets form in. But I'm talking about something uh, which is a slightly different science topic today, but this is a similar physics to the other things I've done. Uh, and that's actually um, the physics of exoplanet evaporation, and in particular, the uh, evaporation of actually the rocky cores of planets themselves. So we're talking about planets that are super close to their star and super close. Um, so why are we interested in these things? I think, I mean, the, the reason they became interesting was because we found some, right? So um, what I'm showing here is an average light curve of uh, this object, KIC 1255B. It's got about five other names as well, um, which is uh, a light curve measured from uh, the Kepler satellite. So Kepler is a broadband optical uh, telescope in space that stared at you know millions of stars for a very, very long time, and it measured their flux. Right? So this is a white light flux, and then it's normalized to sort of the average flux of the star. And then every once in a while, you get this. This is a fine series, and this is a folded one, an average one. Uh, so you get this dip, and this dip's coming from something that's passing in front of the star, right? So um, when you look at the phase folded light curves, you can see that it's not symmetric, right? It's also not steady. So each one of these um, pluses, well, triangles more, is actually pointing to where the transits are. So some of them are there, some of them are missing completely, some of them are much weaker. Um, so it has this non-steady behavior. So we knew straight away that we weren't looking at you know, a planet, right? That's going in front of the star. We're looking at something else. So the thing that we think we're looking at is a dusty tail, something like this, okay? And, you know, a dusty tail makes sense. You're gonna have a sharp uh, ingress, so it's gonna, um, you know, the light curve drops rapidly, and then it should rise more slowly because the optical depth through this tail gets smaller as you go away from the planet, right? So that sort of naturally explains the kind of the shape of it. On top of that, this little peak here is real. It's uh, measured and the, the signal to noise there is uh, a few. And we think that that's probably due to forward scattering. So light, you know, is coming off, um, coming off the star. So just before the planet passes in front of the star, light coming off the star, you know, hits the dusty tail and then, then is scattered into our line of sight, right? So that scattering into our line of sight gives you a little bit of extra flux that reaches us. So you get this bright. So all of this kind of points to the fact that what we're probably seeing is a dusty tail that's coming from uh, some kind of planet. Look at the, the depth of this and things like that. You can try and work out how much mass this thing is losing. It's losing maybe uh, at least, so uh, if it's optically thick, right, then you don't know exactly how much dust it's losing, right? So you can make an assumption that most of this tail is optically thin. And then you can say from the depth of this transit, if it's optically thin, then I must be uh, having this much dust between me and the star. And you can work out roughly what the amount of dust that this planet's losing. And you work out that it's about a tenth of an Earth mass every giga year, or an Earth mass in the age of the universe. So these things are evaporating enough that in the lifetime of the universe, um, uh, that these planets are gonna disappear completely. And that's kind of like a hard lower limit. And in reality, probably the amount of dust that's being lost from these planets, the amount of solid mass that's being lost from these planets is much more. Um, so a number of like, the nations were put forward. Somebody said maybe it could be explosive volcanism or something like that. But the most popular one today is actually kind of like a hydro hydrodynamic wind. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, okay, so uh, more evidence that these things are uh, dust grains. So before I was showing you Kepler, and Kepler was a broad band white light curve. So we didn't know no spectral information. The creatures. This is a ground, what I'm showing here on the um, right is ground-based data from the large binocular telescope, and it observed in a few different um, uh, wavelengths between 0.5 and 2 microns. And if you, I mean, this data is super noisy, right? But, um, but you could see that essentially, uh, roughly, the, um, the depth of this transit is more or less constant. It doesn't vary very strongly with, with wavelength. Um, so if it was, you know, a line or something, you wouldn't see this. Um, uh, uh, but you know, it can you can use this information to tell you something about the stuff that's between us and us. So what they've actually done is they've tried to model this and say, okay, you know, what does this actually tell us? 
So basically, if you think about simple scattering, scattering laws, me scattering, something like that, basically it tells you that the size of the particles between you and, uh, and the star are going to be roughly bigger than the wavelength of the light, so bigger than more or less a micron. You get that uh, just in a hand wavy way. And then detailed calculations from modeling the tails, they're showing sort of, uh, this is a a posterior probability distribution from some tail modeling as a function of brain size. This is log brain size, uh, log 10 of brain size, so this is coming in an enormous range. Right? But what it's kind of telling you is that here in the middle is one micron, that we think the particles are at least a micron or maybe a bit bigger. Uh, it doesn't matter too much what you think the material is made of, you come to that same conclusion. You're probably seeing dust grains that are bigger than about a micron, um, and that's what's producing these. I think that's fine. Not all of these materials are necessarily realistic materials um, for what we might think from the physics and chemistry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they will come to the same conclusion. So why else might we care about so why might we care about studying these things? Um, so the thing that got me excited is that we basically don't know anything about the composition of exit. So we know that exoplanets are unlike the planets in the solar system. So this is a plot essentially of a, a semi-major axis and mass of a bunch of known exoplanets. Um, and we see that you know there are loads of exoplanets essentially small distances from the star, right? Less than one AU, 0.1 AU, uh, much closer to the star than we have any planets in the solar system. Uh, and if you you know you take this plot, you follow it in the biases and you work out how many planets we have per star, you get, you know, of order one planet per star for every star in the galaxy. But they're peaked at this distance, much closer to the star than we have in the solar system. And they're also typically a few times the mass of the Earth. So they have different, you know, they have quite different observational properties um, uh, and statistical properties to what we see in the solar system, right? So the question is then, you know, are these planets like the planets in the solar system? And what can we find out about? So, you know, uh, what are they made of is a really interesting question. And for most of these planets, all we can get, you know, is a mass or radius. We can turn that into a density. And if you plot the, the planet density on a curve like this, right, you can see you can see that we've got some things up here that have large radii, and they have a density which is uh, close to what you would think of hydrogen, so a gas giant like Jupiter. We've got a bunch of these things that fall on, you know, something called pure rock, which is essentially, um, uh, you know, something that's essentially roughly Earth-like. Um, and there's a lot of scatter, and there's obviously some thick things in between. So this is kind of all we know about the interior composition of most exoplanets. Right? Um, and if you go back to the minerals I had on the slide before, right, then basically all of these minerals would happily Within the com within the scatter of this data, so these uh, catastrophically evaporating planets are interesting because essentially it's the first way that we can have direct access to what the core of a planet might be made of by looking at essentially the evaporation of materials. So that's why I found these things exciting, and I thought it'd be interesting to study them. Um, right. So what is the basic picture? Well, the basic picture we have is we have a planet. I know this is very small. We have a planet that's facing our star. Um, and because of the tides, uh, um, the rotation period of the planet is going to be damped until it's the same as the orbital period. So that happens very quickly. But we think throughout most of the lifetime of these planets, the same face of the, the planet is going to be uh, seeing the star, right? So that means we're going to have a very hot day side of the planet. Uh, so hot that it um, we can melt the rock. The, die so the night side can be very cold. Uh, it's not seeing any radiation from the star. These things, we don't think they have very extreme atmospheres. They have very little mass. So it's probably very difficult to transport heat from the day to the night side. So we have an enormous temperature gradient from the day to the night side. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the physical picture of the system we think we're seeing. And essentially this hot day side, we're able to not just melt the rock, we're actually able to evaporate some of it, vaporize it, turn it into a gas, and then uh, that material is hot enough that it escapes. So what we think we're seeing is the escape material from the day side of these planets. 
that is then expanded, somehow cooled, and then reformed dust. And we've seen that reformed dust. So we have must have this process of uh, evaporation and expansion and then cooling. Um, and so if you build a very simple model of this, that's what I'm showing here. This is a simple model that was built a couple of years after, after the first observation was made. Um, uh, you can sort of, you can ask the question, you know, does this basic picture work? So this model is actually a model that's very similar to a Parker wind. So it assumes spherical symmetry. It's a hydrodynamic model. Um, uh, the, they assume that any dust that forms in this, um, and this wind would more or less have a constant temperature, which is set by radiative equilibrium to the star. Um, and they assumed that the gas would essentially expand and cool just due to adiabatic expansion. And they included some other things saying, you know, well, maybe the latent heat from forming dust is going to heat the gas a bit. Uh, and they also included collisional heating between the dust and the gas too. Uh, but those things actually turn out to not be terribly important. And the gas cools quite dramatically. So they said, well, gas cooling and expanding, that's okay. That allows us to form the dust. Um, but rather than modeling any of this in detail, they just did it in sort of a very simple parameterized way. Um, but what they did find was that these models are able to produce more or less the mass, the right mass loss rates. Have I got? Yeah, the right mass loss rates. So showing here is the mass loss rate um, in Earth masses per giga year as a function of the mass of the body that's being evaporated in Earth masses, right? So for a, a, ro a typical rocky material, um, you can get mass loss rates uh, up to, for a very small body, 10 Earth masses per giga year, um, and you get a very steep drop-off. This very steep drop-off um, can be understood simply in terms of a, the Parker wind model, and that's that uh, you get a high mass loss rate, and the thermal energy of the evaporated material is large compared to the gravitational binding energy of the planet. And as that thermal energy goes down with respect to the binding energy, uh, as the binding energy of the planet goes up, then that mass loss rate drops off. So this curve is essentially just um, having the shape because of the drop off of, um, uh, because of the increase of the binding. You have to do more work to lift your gas out of the potential well. The amount of mass loss rate, the amount of mass loss you get it can be incredibly sensitive to what you assume the material that you're evaporating is. Um, because uh, at the base of your flow, um, where the gas is on the surface of the planet, um, uh, here, it's very density. It's, it's going to be hidden behind this graph. Right? There isn't a density. So um, uh, the density, you know, the density and the pressure at the base of this flow is essentially set by the amount of gas you can evaporate from the surface. And that, you know, and that is essentially controlled by what I would call the vapor pressure. So if you heat up a material to a certain temperature in, vac in a vacuum, then some amount of that material evaporates and you get an amount of vapor gas above this material. And the amount of gas above this material is a sensitive function of temperature and it's sensitive to what that material you're heating like. Um, Essentially, the thermodynamic properties of the material that we're evaporating makes a big difference to the amount of gas you have. And that's really what's causing the scaling of these two curves. Um, the most realistic material for what we think we have in, um, uh, in the planet for, for in, out of these two is certainly this one. So at least we can say that we can get mass loss rates that are high enough compared to uh, the observed one. So the, the, this it's 0.1 Earth masses per giga year is the lower limit. So for a sensible material, we can get enough uh, mass loss. Um, so this was kind of the basic picture, and this is kind of how it stood. Um, but nobody had really looked into the question of how much dust should these uh, planets form. This was just, pra this was just parameterized. Um, and uh, so there was essentially a lot of debate about um, uh, whether um, you know, whether or not you should actually be able to form significant amounts of dust on the day side. Um, okay. So before I show that one, I'll go back to this. And one of the important things here that sort of sparked this debate is, are you actually forming dust on the day side where it sees all this high temperature from the star and is maybe being evaporated and destroyed? Was what we see here is a trailing tail. And if you just do the simple orbital 
dynamics of what happens when you fire a particle off a body that's in orbit of the star, and you say it's got a slightly different energy, right? So it travels on a slightly different orbit. You actually find that you know firing material towards the star would actually cause you or you to cause you to have a leading transit rather than the tail, sorry, a leading tail rather than a trailing tail, right? So people said, well, we tend to see um, trailing tail, so maybe it's mass loss from the night side of the planet. Um, uh, and it was a question about whether you could form dust on the in the in these outflows in the first place. So that's what I wanted to have a look at and see if we could resolve that question: How do you form dust? Um, so the default answer as to why you get the trailing tail is that we have radiation pressure. Radiation pressure on the grains uh, acts against the gravity, and then that essentially if effectively lowers the mass of the star that the dust grain feels compared to the mass of the star that the planet feels. And because of that, uh, it, it orbits with a longer period. And you have this trailing tail instead of the, the the leading one. So that was sort of the, the two competing explanations for what's going on here. Are you forming a, a leading tail? So are you forming a, tra a trailing tail because of radiation pressure or because of um, mass loss from the night side? So this was sort of that other model where we would have our star here and our magma ocean, our magma pool, uh, with some mass loss from the daytime. But somehow we'd have flow around the, the surface of the planet uh, and then as that flow converges on the night, the night side, it might drive a, um, a wind from the night side. So is this realistic? Well, the model for this was actually based on a very similar model from Ingersoll in the 1980s that was used to explain transport of, um, I, think it, I think it was water, uh, from the day side to the night side of Io. And this was done in, in sort of a very simple model. And the idea is that we have a high temperature here, and because the pressure, the vapor pressure, is a very strong sense function of temperature, and we have a low temperature here, we have a very strong temperature gradient from the day side to the night side. So we have a very strong temperature gradient. You do expect a flow from the day side to the night side. Um, but the question we had when we saw this is, how realistic is this picture for, of, um, uh, for the, the systems that we're interested in? And the worry was that the, these models, the models that were developed for IO, were, were a shallow water type model. So the idea is you integrate your fluid structure in, the, in this direction, assuming hydrostatic equilibrium, and then you just compute kind of one dimensional pressure gradients in that way to get your flow. Um, you can do that, but if you do that, you're going to want the thickness of your layer to be small compared to the planets, right? Um, but uh, this plot sort of already gives away the fact that that can't be true for these planets that are evaporating strongly. Because I told you, this drop off of this curve comes uh, from comparing the binding energy of the, uh, you know, is, is determined by comparing the binding energy of the, the planet to the thermal energy of the material, right? So if the thermal energy of the gas is comparable to the binding energy of the planet, you're always going to be in the situation where the thickness of that atmosphere is a, cons uh, is a considerable fraction of the planet's radius. Right? So you're never really in a model that, um, uh, never really in a situation that a vertically integrated model is going to work. This was the kind of worry about this picture was that, um, you know, uh, was that, you know, we can't really use a, a simple shallow water model to explain this system. And um, we did some actually simple, you know, uh, 2D calculations, some 3D calculations where we just parameterized the temperature structure and found that what was really happening was, you know, that you, uh, that you would get a lot of flow from the day side and some of that would wrap around the planet, but it would escape as it's wrapping around the planet. You never get this kind of night side, um, this night side uh, loss. So we wanted to come back at this and try and work towards building, you know, a reasonable model to understand the outflows in this system in, in the hope that, you know, down the line, we can actually use some of the properties of the outflows, the material we can see to learn something about the interior. So what I'm gonna talk about now is some work I was doing with 1D models uh, to essentially better understand uh, what's going on the day side and to understand whether, um, whether, uh, dust can form in this outflow from the day side. Uh, and 
the dynamics and the transport from the day to the night side is something that we'll have to come back to in the future. It's what we're working on at the moment. Right, so um, the basic model is a time-dependent uh, hydrodynamic model where I have separate fluids for the gas and I model the dust as a pressureless fluid, okay? And these two are coupled by drag forces. Um, and on top of that, I have a model for potentially the formation of dust grains um, in the flow, because that's essentially one of the questions I want to answer. Can we, can we form dust on the, the, the day side? So how do I do that? Well, the simplest way to say, uh, to model, to model uh, dust formation would be to say, okay, maybe it's in some kind of thermodynamic equilibrium, but that in a sense doesn't work uh, because we know that we see these tails far away from the planet where they can't be in thermodynamic equilibrium because thermodynamic equilibrium would tell you there uh, would be no dust. So we need some picture that has a growth rate of a grain and a destruction rate of a kinetic. So the simplest kinetic picture you can have is say, well, I've got a, a, a grain and it's in a gas, right? And I have collisions between the grain and some gas particles. If those gas particles have the right composition, then they might stick to the surface of my grain with some efficiency. So we can look at lab data and say, you know, we can compute that rate of collision relatively easily if I know the size of my grains. And I can look at lab data and say, and work out what the sticking fraction is in the chemistry. So we know that our gas has got the right composition for forming dust because we evaporated rock to start with, right? So it's made of the same stuff I want to form rock from. So that simplifies the problem a bit. Um, yeah, so, um, and then, so that's how you compute the, uh, the growth rate of the grain. And then you can get to the evaporation rate of the grain by just to look, by saying that the evaporation rate must give me thermodynamic equilibrium when I'm in thermodynamic equilibrium, detailed balance. So in thermodynamic equilibrium, the growth and the, and the, um, and the destruction rate must be equal. So that's what we put together to get a growth rate for our grains. Um, so in reality, this would tell me how the mass of an individual grain would grow over time. And then I would need another equation saying, okay, what creates a grain? How many grains have I got? So I should have one equation for how much, how my, uh, the rate at which my grains grow, so I know how big they are. And then another equation saying, how often do I form a new grain, right? That would be the, the full picture of dust, dust growth. But for this work, we actually cheated. We said, what I'm interested in most is more or less the mass of uh, gas that I can convert to dust. So what I said was I took this growth rate, um, for a single grain, and I multiplied it by the number density of grains, and then said that that's actually the total rate of which I'm converting uh, dust and gas between each other through evaporation and con condensation. So I didn't worry, but um, uh, in reality, there's this extra process of forming grains. So I said, actually, I'm applying this, which should tell me the rate at which I'm losing gas and losing dust grains, and I'm saying that I think these grains are on average close to some size, which I just chose based on the observation. Um, uh, and the reason for doing this essentially is that you get a model that can uh, match the correct thermodynamic equilibrium. So in high density regions, you're gonna get the system reaching thermodynamic equilibrium. And then in low density regions, I'm able to roughly have a right lifetime of dust grains when, um, when you know, they're far away from the planet and they're net evaporating. So this was the simplest possible system we could come up with that could you know, plausibly reproduce the, um, the, um, the observations. And we could do it without going into vast number of details about the chemistry and what Going beyond that, we need to know specifics about the chemistry and we wanted to avoid doing that. Uh, okay, this is just an equation for conservation of energy. So, uh, in addition to the hydrodynamics equations and the growth and destruction of um, uh, uh, dust, there's also uh, the energy equation that we solve. And we solve the energy equation, you know, essentially including ready to trans transfer. So, um, because what we're seeing is a gas made up of molecules, um, you know, a few uh, sim relatively simple molecules, iron, magnesium oxide, silicon oxide. Um, we compute the opacity based on essentially 
the molecular spectra of these. And then I can trace radiation from the star through my grid, compute the heating and the cooling rates of the gas and the dust. Um, for the dust, I've actually just assumed a very simple opacity law here, because I'm starting off with something that is uh, the simplest approximation I can get away with. So that is what I would call like a gray approximation. So the wavelengths of light that are smaller than the size of the gray. Um, I just assume that uh, you know, the opacity is constant. And then once the wavelength of light gets larger than the grain, you have Rayleigh scattering, right? Where the, the absorption cross-section essentially gets smaller and smaller as the wavelength of light gets. So we can put that together to have a simple model of the opacity, which is made up of essentially, uh, you know, uh, this line by line calculation from the gas and then something very approximate. The reason we need to consider these um, separately becomes evident on the next slide where I'm essentially now showing the results of these models. Um, so these are models where uh, left to right, I vary different plans um, uh, and everything else I've kept fixed, uh, which uh, were set to the observational properties of uh, the system I showed you on the first. So top to bottom, I'm showing density in the flow, Mach number and temperature. Um, and the, the curves to look at first, I think, are um, the, the dust curves. Which are the orange ones, and we can see that um, the dust density. And we can see that some of these models have formed dust in the outflow. You can see that there's a significant amount of dust density, and some of these haven't. Right? Um, and so, uh, so we wanted to you know. So why? What what's happened here? So um, what happens in the first one? Yeah. How am I, the best way to explain this? So. Um, I talked about the growth of grains being rel uh, related to essentially this idea of pressure, vapor pressure, and when the okay. and the and the pressure at the base of the atmosphere in the gas is set by the evaporation of material from uh, the the um, from the surface of the planet, right? So uh, it's set by essentially an equilibrium there. Um, so if I move away from the planet, and I'm going to change the temperature of my gas and the temperature of my dust. Um, the dust grains are going to want to grow if there's extra gas pressure. So the gas pressure is above the equilibrium pressure at which the, the rate of uh, evaporation and condensation onto, onto the dust surface is, is equal. And they're going to want to be destroyed if it's the opposite, right? If the gas pressure is below this equilibrium. So what I'm showing in the... A uh, long dash black line is actually that equilibrium gas. It's now written as a density rather than pressure, but that equilibrium gas pressure uh, for the um, for the model. So we can see actually that the uh, the gas pressure is above the equilibrium one. So we think that dust should, dust should be forming. The actual reason that dust doesn't form in this situation is just because the outflow is too fast. The planet is very uh, very small. Uh, the material escapes very rapidly at high velocity. We've got Mach, you know, large Mach numbers, and the density just goes down very rapidly, and the flow essentially escapes before the grains can grow to life. So that's what's happening. Dust. In the middle case, um, we've got a, a higher mass planet. We've got a lower outflow velocity. That leaves you a, a higher density, and because of that higher density, now the grains grow, right? The grains have grown into equilibrium, so the equilibrium uh, gas curve and the blue curve are sat on top of each other, right? So close to the planet, we have this equilibrium, and the amount of dust we have in the system is set by this. As you get far further away, you can see that the, the lines start to deviate from equilibrium a little bit. That's what you'd expect. Eventually, the pressure in the outflow is dropping so low that you know we cut, that we transition from wanting to form dust to having it be destroyed. And then in this last case, the more massive one, again, we have a high density close to the planet. We'd have conditions to form dust. Um, but again, as we move far further away, the gas pressure drops down and we transition to dust destruction. But for this deeper potential well, uh, the actual time that it takes for the flow to escape, uh, essentially, so this is either the Bondi radius or the Hill radius, to escape from the planet's potential is is long enough that the dust actually just gets destroyed before it gets there. Right? So 
this one on the right, we can form some dust close to the planet, but it gets destroyed essentially because we change back into these conditions like density. Um, so, um, so that's kind of what's going on. Uh, but uh, to understand, you know, there's still one more thing that's important to understand why is uh, why does dust form at all, right? So if we look at the curves, like the pressure is a decreasing function, and I told you that you probably want the, the gas pressure uh, to be in equilibrium with the, the, the vapor pressure at the planet's surface. That's kind of the base condition. You'd certainly expect that in models like this, where the outflow is slow and uh, there's, there's time for the, the gas density pressure to e equilibrate with the balance of water. So the real reason that the, the dust is actually able to form in this, in this case is because the temperature drops quite rapidly as you move away from the planet. So this is what we needed to do to get the um, to, to get dust to form. We needed to understand that the surface temperature of the planet, at least for these lower mass cases, is higher than the temperature of the dust immediately outside the planet where the density is high. So why is that? Um, uh, I'll come to that in a minute. In this case, where we have um, a more massive planet, we have a higher density. Um, the gas temperature and dust temperature and surface temperature all end up in thermodynamic equilibrium uh, right at the surface, where we still have this decrease in temperature, temperature as we move away, and that decrease in temperature is why dust forms. So why does the dust and the gas as well have a lower temperature than the planet's temperature? The answer is actually relatively uh, simple geometry. Uh, if we have a dust grain, it's primarily heated on one side by the star, right? If we're close to the planet, it can be heated by the, um, the, the, it can be heated by the planet as well, right? But if we're far away from the planet, it's going to be heated by the star uh, on one side. Um, but, you know, our dust grains are small and they reach more or less a constant temperature through them. So they can cool through all, all essentially all sides of the, all sides of the dust grain. So um, we have an amount of heating on one side and we pull, pull through all speed. Um, for the planet, however, while we're receiving you know, the same amount of heating roughly on the face of our planet as the face of our dust grain, uh, the temperature, you know, the, the energy isn't able to transport through the planet such that you have this uniform temperature on all sides, right? We just have a hot day side and a cold night side, right? So in both of these cases, if we want to reach equilibrium, because we're cooling through a, a smaller fraction of the area in the planet's case than the dust case, um, we're going to have to uh, reach a hotter temperature. So it's simply that the dust grain can cool through all pi steradians, and the planet's cooling through more like pi steradians. Uh, and that simple difference is essentially essential to, to why dust can form in these outflows. Um, right. So, um, I said that the temperature matters. And I said before that I was using a very simple model for the opacity of the dust grains, where, where the opacity is this dash curve here, the function was a constant up to some size, right? And then start to And this location um, depends on the size of the grain. If I make my grain smaller, this is um, And this actually becomes important because if we think, I model one micron size grains compared to the observation, which are receiving most of their energy here and then re-emitting it um, more or less at the same wavelength. Okay? Um, uh, but if we have the opposite situation where the grains are now small, where the opacity to stellar light is higher than the opacity that they cool through, they end up heating to a hotter temperature. So what I'm showing here is the equilibrium temperature function of grain size uh, for one of these is the, uh, the, so this blue curve is for the, the model that I just described. So smaller grains are hotter, right? And they actually get much hotter than, um, than, um, the, than you know, this, this simple picture that I, that I before would have. And actually they have temperatures that are much closer to the surface temperature. And that's enough that uh, if I was to take a simple model and say, you know, and, and run it with, grain sizes of 0.1 microns or 10 nanometers, actually no dust would form at all because the dust would be too much. This, this effect of having a cooler dust um, 
temperature with a lower vapor pressure wouldn't help us. Um, so that sort of seems like a problem. And that's why I went to have a look at, you know, what happens when we consider real material. So some of these real materials have the same problem as my simple dust model. They have more opacity in the optical than they do in the infrared, and they heat up to too high temperatures. And some of these materials have the opposite property. They don't have much opacity in the optical. They have more opacity in the infrared, like our windows. Um, um, so that sort of um, said, OK, well, we can probably get this to work if the composition of our dust is right. You know? um, in particular, these things that work, um, the difference between these ones and the ones up there are whether they contain much iron in them. So iron, um, so iron is what's providing lots of opacity to the grains in the optical. So if there's not much iron, um, then we have this, uh, this uh, uh, we have the right opacity shape and the grains can cool to a low temperature and dust can so this leads to a, an idea that we think is what's going on in these things, which is initially you actually form these um, relatively uh, iron poor grains. Uh, but because these grains are now very cold, um, essentially, uh, you know, other things, iron, all of the other molecules in the uh, outflow are able to essentially condense onto the surfaces of these grains. Um, and that's going to raise their temperature as we add more iron. And fill in the optical opacity, um, and yeah, and that's going to raise more, raise their temperature. Uh, fortunately, though, um, iron also evaporates from the surfaces of the grains more readily than magnesium. So there should be a kind of equilibrium where the composition and the temperature um, are, you know, uh, match up in such a way that we can have some amount of dust. And then as we get to bigger grain sizes, the composition is going to become less important as the grains become more and more gray. So this is what I think is going on. I think that near, near the planet, we'd have to form some interesting uh, uh, grains that have, uh, so they essentially have a similar opacity to glass. And then as you get further away, we're going to have uh, changes in the composition um, uh, and incorporate more. Art. So. This is interesting from the point of view, if we want to know what the planets are made of, then, you know, we'll learn something by going to look at the dust. Um, but it's also something that we've not included in the models yet, and we need to look at in more detail. Right. That's just what I'm saying. So uh, in addition to this simple stuff I've talked about now, we had a look at a bunch of other things, one of which was variability. So I told you on the first slide that sometimes there's this on-off behavior with deep transits and uh, shallow transits. Um, and if the grains were able to grow quickly enough, so we took the same models and essentially uh, changed, a, changed a parameter which specified how quickly the grains grow, then we start to see variability cycles where we get rapid formation of clumps of dust that are carried out in the wind. Um, and then periods with much less dust force. So we can get changes in dark from that. Uh, and you know this uh, this you know it's possible to see variability in the in the dynamics. So why is this variability here? Essentially um I haven't spotted it. It's because if you form a load of dust you increase the optical depth and if you increase the optical depth uh to the planet then this difference in temperature gets smaller. And you change the conditions from being conditions to favor dust formation to conditions that don't anymore. Um, uh, and then that kind of shuts off the dust formation at the surface in this process. Um, so you don't form any more dust at the surface until uh, this material has been carried out far enough that the optical depth has gone down, and the temperature goes up, and more of this. So you get the cycle of essentially uh, strong dust formation and, and weak dust formation. It's driven by changes in the optical depth. Well, we're also interested in, okay, um, so we have this process. We think we have an idea about uh, what causes uh, the, you know, under what conditions does dust form. We're interested in what can this tell us about maybe the properties of the planets, right? Because we see the tails and not the planets. It'd be interesting to know how common are these planets? You know, what are their masses and things like this? So we ran a grid of models and looked at the, the mass loss rate. So the color on the background is the gas mass loss rate. And at high temperatures and low pressure, sorry, low masses, unsurprisingly, is when you ha have the highest gas mass loss rate. And then, you know, 
at larger masses and lower temperatures, you've got a, a low. The contours here, the black contours here, are actually the regions where the models would predict that we form dust. Okay, so it's a relatively no low region of planet space. The bottom here is dropping out because the flow time scale is uh, too fast for the dust to form. Um, and this one is a combination of also the flow time scale, but also um, optical depth uh, effects as well. So we found that essentially we think that these systems should exist in a relatively narrow region of temperature space, at least for the, the silicate grains we were considering. Um, and we were interested in, you know, what can that tell us about the properties of the planets? How many of these planets? So to work out how many be, essentially you can ask yourself, you know, Kepler have observed, you know, 100 million stars, right? They have a distribution of masses and a distribution of ages. Um, and only when our planets are in the right mass range and temperature range are we going to actually see them. Right? So you do a, essentially a, a correction for the fraction, you know, for the fraction of these stars that should today have uh, planets that are in this right mass range, and a correction for you know a fraction of stars where they have the right orientation, right? because we have to have the the tail between us and the planet. And you can say uh, how often. Um, how often should we see these things? I'm going to skip over. Um, how often should we see these things? Um, so, in terms of the initial mass of the planet and the temperature that the planet would reach at, uh, most of this uh, parameter space is empty. Right? We should, although the planets may evaporate, they should actually never produce these observable tails. And there's a relatively narrow range of initial planet masses and temperatures um, that. Um, that this that would actually go through this observational error. Fortunately, the models get that error in more or less the right place. So the three observed systems, uh, we don't know the masses, right? But, we, but they have temperatures in roughly the range that we think they should work. So that's nice. Um, and if you take that three and you take the efficiencies and ask how many planets per star do we have, then the number that's what this plot is showing. The numbers here are essentially. 0.9 to 1.1. Um, and these are for essentially diff these parameters here are different assumptions about the slope of the, the planet, uh, you know, the, the planet mass distribution. Like, do I have more big planets or more small planets? And do I have, uh, and how do they, uh, and how does the occurrence of planets vary with distance from the star? Um, Neither of these things are well constrained by three planets. It's just we wanted to make sure that results are not super sensitive to this, um, which in a sense they're not. So across this whole range, you don't get any So it seems that you know, within the limitations of the model, we think that these things are actually quite common, uh, and that most of them are sort of in the kind of mass range of half of Mercury or something like that. So uh, it's interesting. Um, but uh, there should be this enormous population of small planets that are currently otherwise unavailable to us. Yeah. So that's everything I wanted to talk through. So I'll put up my con conclusions or summary. So I think ultra short period planet planets an interesting laboratory. Ultimately, we've learned something about planetary interiors using them. We don't really understand the atmospheric dynamics of them very well yet. That's what we're trying to work on. I showed that. Transformation in these systems is certainly possible. Exactly how it works is uh, a question of opacity and causing composition. We showed that uh, the variable nature of these things can be related to essentially uh, the formation of dust and the effect of that has on, on the optical depths of the planet. And we also said that um, you know by having a look at uh, the population of these things, how frequently they see them. So that's the, the kinds of planets that we're seeing with these small numbers should be really common.